Cool story, bro. But is it true? Can it be tested? Can it be experimentally validated? And is the story of an adaptation actually something we should believe in? Let's discuss how to, how to look into adaptations. Give examples of how to test hypotheses on adaptations. Calculate phenotypic plasticity and define bias and precision. Compare and contrast as always. So this is testing. One, two, three. Let's test these hypotheses with me. Ox peppers. Classic symbionts, right? So what they do is they remove ticks. They remove ticks from the uh, from the animals, and in return, they get a little bit of a meal. So pretty selfless little birds. They're, they're just, you know, helping maintain the parasite load. Well, that's a hypothesis. Do they actually maintain the parasite? Do they actually reduce the parasite load on oxen? So ox peckers. Here we see one looking into the ear. Is it trying to get a parasite out of there, or is it just picking earwax? Ew, gross. Anyway, treat the story as a hypothesis. Let's actually look at it. So we're going to look at tick load here. And what that is, is uh, they're going to take the number of ticks present on an ox. So they have three treatments here. The first treatment, the gray ones, are going to be put in, uh, in an environment with ox pickers. And then the purple ones are going to be put in an in a treatment without ox pickers. What they saw in the first one is the ox picker free one had a few more ticks, but not like a lot more ticks. It's not even significant. The error bars are overlapping with each other's means, so and not much. In the second treatment, the one without the ox pickers actually had fewer ticks. So it turns out the ox pickers were adding ticks almost. And then in the third treatment, it was significant that there were uh, fewer ticks in the ox picker treatment and that was actually a significant finding. Now here's one of the things. This is why repeated tests are needed for validation. If they just did the third experiment and nothing else, they would have found that ox pickers, in fact, do reduce tick load. But by repeating the experiment three times and moving these oxen around to control for it adequately, they found that, in fact, ox pickers aren't taking the ticks away. They found that even some of the scientists could pick off more ticks from an ox than an ox pecker, and they were also able to see that the oxen were actually trying to get rid of these birds. Well, so what did they do? Well, they noticed that these open wounds on the oxen were maintained. So the ox peckers actually keep wounds open on an animal. So if you look at the mean number of wounds per ox in all three treatments, you'll notice that it is always significantly higher in the ox picker treatment. Oh, sorry, I'm actually looking at this. I was like, check the significance. None of them are below 0.05. Okay, never significant. <laughs> sorry, I thought it was significant on the third one. <laughs> it is not. All right, the oxen try to shoot the birds away and keep them away from open wounds, but the oxen are actually keeping wounds open and drinking blood. Huh. So they also eat a lot of earwax, which you don't know if that's good or bad for the oxen, but maintaining an open wound and drinking blood is generally regarded as bad. So these ox pickers are not classic symbionts. In fact, they're vampires. Yeah. So testing these hypotheses can sometimes be surprising. What we assume might be true under one circumstance where it looks like, eh, the trend looks like it might be okay, test it multiple times. Really dig into this. Can have a controlled experiment, and you might find that the opposite is actually true. So ox pickers are bad for oxen. And there are actually some examples of rhinos that, where the ox pickers will actually open up the skin and drink the blood. So disgusting vampires. Tefritid flies. So... This is a good, this is a well-done experiment, by the way. You're going to like this. Why am I covering these experiments and tests? Well, again, I want you to think about senior seminar, and I want you to think about future experiments and how they line these up. These are some good examples. This is a tephritid fly and a face-off with a spider. And what happens is a tephritid fly has these markings on their wings, and it flips their wings about a little bit, so almost looking like legs twitching. Now, if you've seen jumping spiders, they twitch their legs a lot. So when the tephritid fly is facing the jumping spider, it almost looks to a jumping spider, like another spider. So this kind of is a sheep and wolf's clothing example. And the hypothesis is that the tephritid fly is able to fool spiders and scare them away with its wing display. Well, spiders attack other things too. So perhaps a tephritid fly is able to scare away um, other predators with this wing display. So how did they investigate it? A lot of fly wing surgery. So sometimes they just untreated them. They just uh, test the effect of the wing markings plus the wing waving. Um, since they were going to snip some wings, they cut the wings off and then re-glued them to the fly to control for any effects of any experiment, any operation. 
they um they added then added house fly wings instead of the fancy wings. They then took a house fly and added zo and added the temperated fly wings, and because that's what they won't wave the house fly won't wave their wings at a spider, and then they just left a normal house fly. If <clears throat> There's no mimicry. If this is actually just some useless display, like the oxpeckers, useless, the jumping spider will attack, 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 attack. Always attack. Go on attack. Destroy the flies. No, that's what it will do. And any other predator, if it's not fooled by this, then it will attack, 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 attack. It's not a spider, it's a fly. Eat it. You know, so basically any of these treatments would result in attacking. What about if mimicry deters predators but not jumping spiders? So it looks like a jumping spider, but the jumping spider is not fooled. You're like, dude, I, I can see your I can see your antennae. Dude, no, you don't even have eight eyes. Anyway, in that case, other predators would retreat when faced with the wings and the waving. But any other behavior, the wings being wrong or the waving being wrong, and the other predator will attack. So what about mimicry deters just jumping spiders? Well, in that case, the wings plus the waving will cause a jumping spider to retreat, but any other combination will cause attacks. So what happened? Well, the response of the jumping spiders, when they saw the wings on the tephrited fly, they retreated or attacked and killed it. Sometimes, sometimes they don't get fooled. When they saw the wings on the tephrited fly that had been re-glued, they retreated, or sometimes attacked and killed. Um, any other combination, they either attacked or stalked and attacked. Sometimes they did retreat from the uh, tephrited fly or the tephrited, or the fly with tephrited wings, suggesting a slight effect efficacy, but not a significant one. And any other predators, they didn't care. They just attacked, always attack, eat and attack. So the tephrited fly wings appear to scare away spiders. And when they're waved, well, not when they are not waved, of course, put them on a house fly and the spider will still attack. So a really nifty experiment in a very thorough way of comparing all combinations and all possibilities that actually only ended up meeting a certain number of tests. All right, on to the good stuff. You have that favorite, phenotypic plasticity. And this is a behavioral thing, it's time. So Daphnia are these, uh, these little uh, cute little crustacean-like things that will normally swim away from light. Um, they swim, they like to be in a certain level of the water, so swim towards it until they're a certain level, then swim away from it, just in case, because once they have light, uh, any predator that relies on, vi on vision will be able to attack them. When there are fish chemicals, these chiromones, as they're called, the predator, uh, they're predatory chemicals, indicative of the scent of a predator, um, then these Daphnia will dive, 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 woo, 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 and they get away from the fish that way by being going into the areas where there's less light. So what we see is we can see in the blank heart treatment, you have, uh, this, is a, this is a pond where there are lots of fish normally. The Daphnia generally swim at a pretty low depth, you know, about uh, negative two L? I'm not quite sure if the units are. Anyway, they swim down, and when fish are present, they dive, 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 and they do it quite strongly. You can see that black line is the average phenotypic plasticity. It is the, um, it is the reaction norm for that population. That's the reaction norm for the whole population. It's the average change. What about where there aren't very many fish? Well, they do dive, 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 but they don't do it as much, much, much. So if you add chiromones, they start going down. Some groups go down a lot. Some groups go down a little. Some groups actually go up. So there's some bobbing around going on there. But what about in Citadel Park where there aren't fish? And these are Daphnia that have evolved in the absence of fish. Well, what happens is they don't die when you get fish hormones. They're not, or chemicals. They're, they're not familiar with chiromones. They don't know what the smell is. So it smells fishy. Is that a threat? I don't know. Did you do something? No, man, I'm clean. So is this evolving though? So is this under natural selection? Does it vary within a population? Is it heritable? And is it evolving? Well, here's a good test. They actually looked at this one lake and what happened in this lake is they, they, measured, um, they measured the total response over years. So before 1972, there were no fish in the lake. Between in the 1970s and into the early 80s, fish got introduced into the lake, and then later they got introduced at a much lower rate. Okay, 
So how do they get Daphnia from 1970s? Well, it turns out that Daphnia lay eggs, and when they lay eggs, they fall to the bottom, and sometimes they get sediment put upon them, and sometimes, if they're lucky enough, some biologist is going to drill down into the sediment, collect the eggs from the 1970s, and bring them back to life in a very retro fashion. So they can actually make these cores and pick out eggs from given years. When they brought the Daphnia, kind of resurrected them from the 1970s, they found that they had no real response to fish-induced chemicals. So they, some of them did have a response. You can see that one has a huge dive, dive, dive response. Um, the other ones, not so much. And they actually tended to be closer to the light, really. Um, however, between 1976 and 1979, um, they had quite a response. So that phenotypic plasticity evolved during that period, because you can imagine all the ones that didn't evolve it uh, got eaten. But the variation, like they have one family where it varies a lot. You can see there are now two families where it varies a lot. Um, these are the ones that really increase the reaction norm. And last, when there are fewer fish, there's less variability, um, but also less response. So there's less variability in uh, where they started compared to the 1976 and 1979. They're starting out a little lower, actually. So they, they've come down evolutionarily, but they have also come down in phenotypic plasticity levels. So they don't really dive as much when the fish come in. So you can see the reaction norm over time, um, starting off moderate, becoming severe, and then kind of tempering away as a constitutive response comes down. You see where they all started. They started at um, you know, negative 0.1, then they started at negative 0.2, and then they're, they're starting at negative 0.4. So you can see how this is actually going down, and it's evolving. Um, the constitutive response is evolving to be lower, and the uh, reaction norm at one point is very low, a, you know, a real response, but afterwards it's not so much of a response. All right, last bit. Not sure if you may have covered this in chemistry, but bias and precision. It's a good day in archery for me right there when I was still learning the ropes quite a bit. Um, I, that was my group therapy, as it were. Bias means that there is some other factor influencing the results. Something else is going on that is influencing the results outside of the experiment. Um, a small bias can move it just a little bit away from the target. A large bias can move it very far away from the target. Precision is a rep how repeatable the uh, experiments, the results are. So I remember sometimes I will be, you know, weighing out little plantlets, and when I'm weighing out these plantlets, sometimes one will weigh 55 milligrams, one will weigh 75 milligrams, and if the other one weighs 68 milligrams, I'm like, ah, kind of, it's getting a little more precise. They, they, these are repeatable, they're staying in there. But then if the next one's 108 milligrams, I'm like, well, screw that, that's low precision. So then we don't know what the bias is at that point, um, we just know the precision is off. Now if we take the average of all these, which I do, hopefully, we have low bias. I'm not accidentally including the weight of the weigh boat or something like that. But yes, including the weight of the weigh boat would be, be introducing a bias. Breathing on it would reduce precision because the breath is going to vary. So precision is how repeatable your experiments are. Remember the Oxpecker experiment wasn't very precise. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it did not. On the phenotypic plasticity, there could have been an, an interesting bias in that if temperature were a problem in all these years. And you have to also consider, of course, stochastic factors. Variation due to other environmental effects that vary randomly and are out of your control. So hopefully this little talk on adaptation has kind of encouraged you on how to look for experiments, how to design experiments, and of course, for your proposal, how to maybe think about how to test all the different factors. Thank you.